the Antichrist will enter into the church. Hmm. He will become powerfully influential in the whole church, hmm. and that's the temple. If you right. study it, it says he comes into the temple of God. If you study that phrase, naos tutheu, temple of God, you study that in the New Testament, especially in Paul, always refers to the church. All I could see was this light coming in. The Holy Spirit went, it blew into me. I have never been the same since then. That was it. I'm done. I was born again. Welcome to the Weird Christian Podcast. I am your host, Samuel Delgado, and this is episode 62. I interview G.K. Bill about the temple and the church's mission, specifically looking at scripture from the already but not yet perspective. We look at Christ inaugurating his kingdom and us as the church being the end time temple. So with no further ado, let's get weird. Thank you so much for coming back onto the show. Welcome back thrilled to have you back on. Thank you. Um, so for those that are listening, this is our second interview, and the first interview was on your commentary on Revelation. And at the end of that interview, I can't remember if it was, you know, on or, or before the the interview, but you said you recommended uh, the book that we're going to be discussing in this, po this podcast. Um, and I was telling you before we got started today, just how, how much I love that book. Um, and so I want to stress that for the listener. Um, I will put links in the show description, pause this right now, buy the book, read the book. Um, you can read it before you listen to this interview, or hopefully it can spur you on to, to get the book. But I read a lot of books um, for the podcast and just on, on my own. And this is one that um, I, I, I know it's if I'm preparing for an interview, I know it's something that's stretching me and growing me if I'm asking a lot of questions as I prepared. And I've got a ton of questions. I don't know if we're going to be able to get to them all. Um, <laughs> but uh, there was just several points as I was reading. I had to sort of stop and just think. Um, and it it really, it, it blew my mind, honestly. It was uh, it was so good. Um, so thank you so much for recommending that. And um, I didn't quite, well, you said it was basically a sequel um, to the to the Revelation commentary. So speak yeah. more as, as far as how this book came about. Yeah, uh, in uh, my commentary on Revelation, the, I have two commentaries on Revelation. <clears throat> the first one was published in 1999, and it's about 12, 1300 pages. And then years later, in 2015 or so, or 14, I uh, <clears throat> published a shorter version called the Revelation Shorter Commentary, where I uh, didn't use Greek and uh, condensed a lot of the material. And, it's just a little over 500 pages. So um, in the larger commentary, when I came, uh, when I finished commenting on Revelation 21.1 through 22.6, which is the last major vision of the book, I <clears throat> began to see that John was equating the new creation with um, a temple with a city, with the Garden of Eden. So you've got four things that mm. John seems to be equating. Mm. And, um, you, you know, I, some might attribute that to the irrationality of an apocalyptic vision, but I don't think so. And I didn't think so then. I thought, you know, all of these four things, new creation, city, uh, New Jerusalem, um, Eden, and um, uh, God's dwelling with his people or temple is, um, these are all from the Old Testament, and they were actually specific allusions from the Old Testament. So I thought the answer to why John uh, is equating these things, which don't seem equatable, I mean, hey, you would think that, okay, he sees a new creation, then he sees a city, then within the city he sees a temple, uh, and and a Garden of Eden, maybe around the temple or in the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what you might think. But actually, they're all equated. And so that's, this is very hard to understand. And so I, I thought, I've got to go back to the Old Testament. A number of the allusions in Revelation 21, that last vision, are from Genesis, as well as from many other places. But I started in Genesis 1 to 3. 
And so, and this was in the commentary. It was in the, it, it was actually an excursus. I was writing a two page, single space, small font excursus. And basically in that excursus, I sketched out really what ended up being the outline of the book, which is mm-hmm. that Adam and Eve were in Eden, which was a, a sanctuary or a temple. And, um, Adam was the first priest, and Eve a priestess. He was king. She was queen. And um, uh, they were, what do you put in images? Well, in the ancient Near East, you put images. What do you put in temples? I mean, well, in the ancient Near East, you put images in temples. And so they're the living image mm. of God. Uh, and so they're, they're in, the, in, the, in the temple of Eden. And uh, their task should have been, uh, Genesis 128 says what their task was. Uh, it was to rule and subdue and <clears throat> uh, multiply and increase and fill the whole earth. And so, um, of course, filling the whole earth means with their progeny. And it's not just uh, progeny who are zombies. These are image bearing progeny. In other, so that if they had progeny who were truly uh, 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 glorifying God, reflecting his image, um, uh, then Adam and Eve with their progeny should have slowly, perhaps, but surely increased the parameters of that first garden sanctuary. Uh, and as, you know, just as when you have, you get married, you have a small house, you get more children, you got to build the house bigger. That's sort of the I- idea in, in a certain sense. And so uh, the task should have been to expand until the whole earth was covered with the Garden of Eden as a sanctuary. Thus, it would have been the glorification of the earth because uh, all of the progeny, Adam and Eve and their progeny, would have reflected the glorious image of God. Of course, they did not do that. So the whole rest of biblical history is talking about how God began to work toward that goal again and to raise up our last Adam, who would be an end-time priest, an end-time Adam, who would establish this temple and in a new creation and reestablish the Garden of Eden. And uh, so really right from Genesis 1 to 3, you, you, you can see why really in Revelation 21, John uh, uh, actually equates these four realities of new creation, city, temple, and Garden of Eden, because uh, you, you can see that uh, the whole creation should have become temple and uh, it should have become a garden. Mm. And um, so uh, uh, these realities of new creation, temple and garden of, of Eden, all of those you can see are overlapping from uh, the idea of, of Genesis. If Adam had uh, spread that, uh, presence of God, then the whole earth would have been temple, Garden of Eden, and that would have been the whole creation, okay? Yeah, yeah. I.e. new creation. And in other words, it would have been glorified in a way it hadn't been before. The only thing that uh, Genesis 1 through 3 didn't answer was city, because no cities were built then. So what do you, why city? Well, as you read on, you might remember from the book that uh there are prophecies that the temple will be expanded to the whole earth. Mm-hmm. And, and the first expansion is that the temple would expand from uh, uh, the Holy of Holies, cover Jerusalem, mm-hmm. a holy land, and then the whole earth. Mm-hmm. So that uh, the whole earth would have, been, would have become temple, and it would have become New Jerusalem and promised land. And then, of course, Garden of Eden in light of Genesis one to three. So that, that that's how temple, that's how city figured in. So, so you know, I, this was very difficult because it does look at first glance that the, to equate all those four realities in chapter twenty one is 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 sort of uh, you would think. Well, that's just due to the irrationality of visions. You know, we all have dreams that don't make sense. I'm yeah. sure you've had dreams that hmm, that just didn't make sense. Yeah. Why? Yeah. I, how could I have done that? And so, um, but it's not. Once you understand the flow, the original purpose of Genesis 1 to 3, then the flow of redemptive history, you you see why John does it. This is truly the climax of biblical history that Revelation uh, 21 is talking about. But I sketched that out. You ask why the book? 
because I wrote a two page excursus and I, I said, this has got to be developed. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that is fantastic. Um, man, I, just, I just I just love that that, that struck you as such. Um, you know, I think for for most people, myself, I, I, I'll pick up on the garden uh, and that's probably about it. Um, but that's just incredible um, that the the book started there. I have a, a couple questions uh, on what you just said that I actually already uh, had planned, but one that sort of came up speaking of, um, you know, building out this garden and this temple, the serpent, do you see that as uh, an inhabitant of the garden that was native to the garden or was this a foreigner coming in? No, I don't think that the serpent was native to the garden. Um, <clears throat> All we know, though, is that he appears in the garden. Yeah. In my opinion, <clears throat> I think that um, he was, um, I, I think he was outside the garden. Um, Genesis uh, chapter 3 and verse 1, which introduces the serpent for the first time does say now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the lord god had made so it may be that um uh since we assume that all the animals were in the temple um that is in eden i mean um and not outside eden we we might conclude that the serpent uh was inside um yeah. I, I have uh, sometimes said, no, he came from outside, but in the light of Genesis 3, 1, it might be uh, concludable that he was inside. Yeah. So um, do you want to ask a question from there? Well, I've heard both, and I, I was curious what you thought about that, because um, I recently read a book that sort of equated the, the serpent to the Canaanites that were in the promised land, um, and... They sort of equated that with Israel's failure to drive out the Canaanites, and same thing with Adam failing to drive out the Canaanites. Interesting, serpent. very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I have argued that um, uh, when Israel built her tabernacle and temple, um, nothing unclean was to come into the temple. If it did, it was to be killed and thrown out, whether it was an animal or a human being. Now, snakes were considered as unclean. If they came into the sanctuary, they should have been killed and thrown out. And so I've argued that uh, perhaps that the serpent, though God made the serpent, was outside of the garden and came in. And, and Adam, being a priest, should have killed it, destroyed it, and cast it out. Uh, and I, I've contended that there's only there was only one entrance to the garden, the eastward entrance. <laughs> And that Adam should have been a faithful priest guarding. And uh, apparently, again, we, we only speculate here. Apparently, uh, if the serpent was outside, that, that would have been the entrance he would have come through. But Adam was not guarding it. So when he fails uh, uh, in, in the garden, when he falls, uh, God appoints two angels to guard that, uh, that eastern entryway. And the same word for guard is used as, as in Genesis 2.15. Adam was placed in the garden hmm. to serve and to guard. Wow. He yeah. was to be a guarding priest. And it's the same Hebrew word, um, shamer in Hebrew. And so that might indicate that um, this was a failure on his part. You know, we don't have a lot of biblical data. Yeah. Uh, here and in any theory is kind of the best reconstruction that we can make. Yeah. Sure. So I'm trying to interpret what went on in the garden with what went on in the later temple, mm -hmm. so that snake should have been considered unclean, whether it was in or out of the garden, and Adam should have cast yeah. him out. I tend to think he was outside the garden, but I wouldn't go to the stake for that. But yeah. it makes most sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I th and I think he. It works either way. I mean, the like you said, the important, I think, thing to take away is we can clearly see Adam's failure there um, with the garden, regardless of whether he was foreign or, or not. Yeah, there are some scholars, and I, I'm attracted to their view, uh, 
One of them is Meredith Klein in his book, Kingdom Prologue. He contends that the tree of discerning good and evil is uh, the tree where judgment should have taken place, because that phrase in Hebrew, discerning good and evil, is used of Solomon, right. uh, of being able to be a good judge, to discern between the good and evil and judge it. And it's used that way uh, in other contexts, not just of kings, but other, like when a person goes into the promised land, uh, um, uh, they, they, sh- they should be, if they were going to be in the military, they should discern good and evil. Right. Because they, they, they should know what's good and evil and, and judge the evil as they're in the promised land and so on. And so on the basis of that, um, Klein concludes that this tree was like Lady Justice that you see on the top of courthouses today, mm-hmm. symbolizing this is where good and evil is discerned. Mm. So Adam should have gone to that yeah. tree again, whether or not the serpent was in or out of the garden uh, it came from within or without. Adam should have gone to that tree, discern the serpent was evil, and uh, ask ask God to judge it, and to judge it in the name of God. And um, I think that's what should have, that that makes a lot of sense to me. Again, I think that's a good construction. What we're trying to do, the only data we have is data later in the Bible. Yeah. So again, as I tried to interpret the serpent in the light of casting out unclean snakes from the temple. I'm trying to interpret discerning between good and evil, the tree of discerning between good and evil, seeing how that's used elsewhere in the Bible. So that's all we just have, you know, what we're trying to do is interpret the Bible by the Bible here. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, that was kind of a sidebar. There's more I could say on that, but uh, the more I could ask about that as well. But um so speaking of New Jerusalem, you know, we, we see the already not yet uh, paradigm throughout uh, the book of Revelation. And then my question for New Jerusalem in chapter 21 and 22, do you see that same paradigm in 21 with the already not yet? Not in 21. Yeah. So you have in Revelation, in my opinion, in what we call the visionary section from chapter four all the way to the end of the visions in chapter 22, verse six, you have sections that are absolutely about the future, when the yeah. final judgment will occur, when final reward for the saints will occur, uh, when the new creation will appear, when the new heavens and earth will be, the old heavens and earth will be destroyed, when the Messiah uh, would uh, uh, reign absolutely and the saints would reign absolutely with him forever. Um, So uh, I think that that is yet future. Now, uh, is the kingdom, has it already begun? Because in chapter um, uh, 20, of course, where it talks about the the millennium, uh, you you have the statement that's found earlier in the book. Uh, In chapter 20 and verse 6, it says, that those who have a part in the first resurrection over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Now that that's the millennium. That's not chapter 22 or chapter 20. Uh, I mean, chapter 21 yet. So I I think that is um, uh, already and not yet. And the reason that I do, is because chapter 1 and verse 6 says God made them a kingdom and priest. And then that is reiterated in chapter 5 and verses, verse 10, where it says uh, they are a kingdom and priest, and they are reigning on the earth. Hmm. So there is some manuscripts in that verse say they will reign on the earth. But in the light of uh, chapter 1 and verse 6, we know that has begun. Um, I I think the more likely those manuscripts that say they are reigning on the earth is a more likely reading. Um, And I think what that shows is even if chapter 20 in the millennium is yet future, the the kingdom that's yet future has begun. Yeah. So if chapter 20 is about the future, then it's about the consummation yet future of the kingdom that has begun. Right. And then in chapter 21, it concludes with, well, at the, in, in 22, it says that um, 
There'll no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. His bond servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face. His name will be on their foreheads, and they will reign forever and ever, says in verse 5. So that reign that began in the church age is, is really consummated in the new heavens and earth. Mm, I love that. Um, so you, you mentioned a couple things about um, New Jerusalem that really blew my mind, uh, probably, probably towards the end of the book. Um, you mentioned earlier about this temple um, in, in the garden that was supposed to essentially cover the entire earth. Correct. So can you talk about, you know, it, a, a lot is always said about the, the cubic uh, shape of New Jerusalem. That's um, right. So what was your analysis of why we see that cube shape? <laughs> well, first of all, it does say in chapter 21 that as a part of this new heavens and earth, in, first of all, it says, verse one, I saw new heaven and earth. Verse two, I saw Jerusalem, uh, the new Jerusalem, the holy city coming down out of heaven, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I think that's the people of God pictured a city. So he sees new heavens and earth. He sees the new Jerusalem. But then in verse three, he hears. And it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He, he will dwell among them. They'll be his peoples and God will dwell among them. Now in Revelation, when you see a vision and then you hear either God or Christ or an angel or some heavenly elder say something, the statement interprets what is seen. And sometimes it's reversed. What is heard, like chapter five, uh, uh, behold, the, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah has conquered. Then the, immediately, the immediate next verse in chapter five is, and I saw a lamb standing as slain. Hmm. Well, how does the messianic lion from the tribe of Judah conquer? By being slain. It's an ironic victory through death. So, uh, so you get this what I call an interpretative pattern here. Sometimes you see the vision, then the statement, and, and the statement's meant to interpret the vision, and sometimes it's vice versa. Here, you get the interpretation, I saw new heaven and earth, I saw new Jerusalem, and then God's dwelling among his people. So right there, you sort of get an equation mm. of at least the three right there. But, but mm. your question was about the cubic shape, but I wanted to start with how the new creation and the holy city are interpreted in verse three to be this dwelling, which is a prophecy from Ezekiel 37, 27 about God dwelling among his people. And, um, and there it actually says he's over the whole promised land. At that point, it's expanded from temple, uh, not just a city, but the promised land. If you read carefully in Ezekiel 37, 27, very intriguing. Mm. So, but the cubic measurement, he then sees in chapter 21, uh, an angel measuring. And in verse 16, it says the city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as the width. And he measured the city with the rod, uh, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. That phrase is virtually verbatim from 1 Kings 6.20, which describes the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. That's what's going on here. He is describing the city that is the new heavens and earth and the Eden as the cubic holy of holies. Why? Because God has burst out of the holy of holies, which is the heavenly dimension. Remember the holy of holies is heavenly dimension. That's where his feet extend from the invisible heavenly dimension. Now he's burst out from the holy of holies, covered the whole earth. <laughs> That's unbelievable. It's amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. When I read that, it just... Wow. I mean, it's sort, I, it's sort of like if you ever have you ever watched Star Trek, uh, you know, there are Trekkies that still watch Star Trek and it, there, there, there is a um, there, there's a planet. Oh, who, who are the it's always it's it's the enemy of uh, the Star Trek uh, Federation. I can't remember <laughs> what their name is. But at any rate, the planet was a square planet. It was all city. And. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the, the idea here pictorially, but uh, 
of course, it's not it's not literal. It's not to be understood literally. So um, all, all of these things merge together and and are uh, ultimately one reality through four different ways of presenting that reality. Yeah, no, it's, it's incredible. It's a uh, you know, so I've heard about the cube shape. And in fact, I've heard people say uh, that they're describing a pyramid there. Um, but when I read that, um, it's just, it's very, very fitting. Actually, it's not a box or a square. It's a cube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So my next question, I think probably need to back up and uh, talk about the structure uh, the, the three section structure of the temple uh, and how that's modeled uh, after the cosmos. Uh, can you talk about that? Well, first of all, it's modeled on two things. Number one, it's modeled on the creation itself, uh, even before the fall, so that you have um, <clears throat> uh, Eden was the place of living waters. And I think that's where God's presence was in Eden. That, that's where the Holy of Holies was. And then the Garden of Eden is the garden next to Eden, actually. It's not Eden itself. So the garden is the outer court. That represents the outer court of the temple. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, um, uh, the, the, the hall that's, that's right outside the Holy of Holies, the holy place, that's what it was called. So you get you know, God's living presence at, at the living waters, then the garden actually represents the next area outside that, which is the holy place where priests serve, which is where Adam was. And then outside of uh, Eden, you get uh, the uninhabitable area. So you have three places there. And, um, and then the next time you find three sections like that is at Mount Sinai. And uh, Sinai is divided into three parts, as you might I have that in my book. Yeah. And uh, so the, the top part is the Holy of Holies, where the, the, the Ark of the Covenant was created. Hmm. The second part is where uh, uh, the 70 elders could go, yeah. um, not the rest of Israel. So they were, they, they were kind of a priestly group. And then be the, below is where the people were. So there, there are three parts there. And then the, the tabernacle was based on that. Yeah. Now, you should get Michael Morales on this podcast and read some of his books. Get him to advise you what book to read because he's written about Sinai as a temple and how that relates to Eden and, and other things. And um, he's also written on biblical theology, I think, on Leviticus. But um, um, if, you, if you want more discussion of the temple, he would be very good. Michael Morales. Yeah, uh, I, I really recommend his his uh, books. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, now that's how the temple uh, sanctuary and temple was. That's why it was in three parts. But also there are three parts to the cosmos. As you think of the cosmos, there is the invisible dimension of the heavens. And that's what the Holy of Holies represented, because it, it really is the link, the literal link between uh, uh, earth and heaven. That's where, you know, God's sitting on his throne in heaven, his legs are extending down figuratively onto the Ottoman of the Ark of the Covenant. Mm -hmm. Then you get the holy place, and that, that represents uh, the literal, visible, starry heavens. In Solomon's temple, if you looked into Solomon's temple, it would be dark in the holy place, but you would see 70 lights, because there were seven lampstands, sorry, 10 lampstands with uh, seven um, uh, burning uh, wicks on, on each of them, uh, well, bur burning with oil. And um, it would have looked like a solarium. And in mm -hmm. fact, even the uh, um, materials uh, that, that were um, around the... Um, holy place. These were, um, had the colors of uh, red and blue and purple and yellow, kind of uh, reflecting uh, what 
the heavens looked like from the earthly viewpoint. And even there were uh, birds woven into some of these cloth materials, um, these curtains. Um, so it was the whole thing was made to look like uh, the visible heavens. Yeah. Wow. Then the outer court, this represented the earth itself. So you think about it. First of all, there was this huge thing called the Bronze Sea. Mm -hmm. It was huge. You had it was a ladder to get into it, and uh, and then there were other wash bowls that were waist high, also in the courtyard that priests would wash in, and and they would wash in the big one too. But the point why so big? I think it was to represent the seas, mm -hmm. and um, supporting uh, around its bottom and around the other wash bowls especially the Bronze Sea, were um, oxen, each one pointing to uh, uh, one direction of the earth, like a compass to yeah. four directions of the earth. And, um, and also there, there were um, uh, plant-like designs around the bottom. So this, this probably represented uh, the earth. And in fact, all of Israel could come into the courtyard. Yeah. Uh, only priests could enter into the holy place and only the high priest to the holy of holies. But all people could come in to the courtyard, which probably represented human habitation. Yeah. And uh, in fact, it's it's apparent that, uh, and I talk about this in the book, that Israel actually was given the mantle of Adam. So they were a corporate Adam. So here's the corporate Adam in the um, in the courtyard. Uh, so if that's the case, if, if the temple was intended as a little model of the tripartite, um, cosmos, um, why, uh, my contention was it wasn't to be forever because Isaiah 66, God says, can you build a place for me that I would dwell? And the answer is no. And why? Because of everything else that I, I talk about other passages that say God, God will ultimately, the only place for his dwelling is his creation. And, uh, and, and there'll come a time when the whole creation is holy of holies, and he will dwell, his presence will be in every nook and cranny. So I think the idea is this, why the model? There'll come a time when God will break out of the invisible heavenly realm and cover the visible starry realm and the visible earth, and thus really um, created anew um, because it's sinful, his presence. When his presence comes into sin, it burns it away. So there'll be a destruction of new heavens and earth mm. at that point. Mm. So, um, so that's the idea. It's like I, I went to a church in New England many years ago. It was small, and they needed to expand. And so they got an architect to make a little model of, what the bigger church would look like. Well, when people came into the narthex of the church, they uh, they would look at it, um, and they were intended to think about how that was going to expand. They were not to look at it, oh, isn't this a wonderful model? Oh, my goodness. Uh, uh, the, the, the architect is such a good model maker. Oh, uh, well, if they don't think about how it's going to expand, they miss the whole point. Yeah, I think those with eyes to see and ears to hear in Israel, which I think would have been the remnant, would have seen that this model had that significance. I don't think too many recognized it, but some didn't. Wow. And one thing that you said, I think this is probably towards the end of the book as well, also blew my mind, um, which you, you, you pretty much just mentioned just then. Uh, we see a picture in New Jerusalem um, of new heavens, new earth, now, now becoming one. Um, but we also get this picture of the veil or this in, in this case the areas s separating earth from the holy of holies right as you mentioned the three tiers that that in this case would be a picture of a veil the second heaven being torn in this cosmic exactly. temple that's right you know that i think that was the symbolic significance of the torn curtain right when jesus died and then rose again right yeah it symbolizes god breaking out of the holy of holies and right when that happens, one of the Gentile Roman centurions becomes a Christian. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it's just God's breaking out now. What's happening? Mm. He's not going just to Jews. 
Mm. He's also going to Gentiles. Mm. Wow. It's amazing. Yeah. And in, in fact, the destruction of heavens and earth uh, is pictured in, in Revelation chapter six. And just the way that you mentioned, um, listen to the description of it. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. And the idea is, so you have a scroll and uh, you, you, you unroll it, um, cut it, and both of them end, end up rolling up. Sure, yeah. And so that's a picture of, uh, you know, God splitting the dimensional curtain of the new mm -hmm. heavens and earth. It just rolls mm -hmm. up and disappears. Can't see anything. Just wow. like you can't see anything in the scroll. Wow. That's yeah. incredible. I love that. Um, and that's amazing. Um, okay, so another thing that uh, I had some curiosities that you mentioned in the book as well um, about the the earthly temple essentially being uh, a, a model, in, in this case, a figurative model of the physical, literal temple that we have in heaven. Um, is, is that a correct understanding? Um, say that again one more time. Um, so, you, you know, we sort of think of the, the actually, I think in this case it was the tabernacle you, you were speaking of. As the, you yeah. think of the tabernacle as, as being... Um, as being real, right? Physical, literal, and what yeah. we see in the, in the heavenly dimensions as, as being, um, you know, spiritual, in this case, figurative, figurative. right? You sort of reverse yeah. that, and we actually see, in this case, what we have is a real, literal, physical model in the in the heavens, and the tabernacle, what we've seen is actually a figurative model off of it. Is that correct? That's beautiful. In fact, Hebrews chapter um, 9 speaks of the old physical tabernacle as a parable in Greek. That means parable. Mm. Parable is figure. Mm. It's figurative. That's what's figurative. And Hebrews is saying the one in heaven, the, the one that Christ entered to, that's the real one that the physical one pointed to. Yeah. And it's a figurative one. The figurative yeah. pointed to the real. <laughs> yeah. and, and so we have evangelicals thinking there's going to be another physical temple rebuilt in Israel in the end times. And why that reverses the typology. And uh, because, because yeah. the physical pointed to the true temple in heaven mm -hmm. and to Christ, who is the temple. Mm -hmm. And when you have types fulfilled, uh, you don't go back. Right. to the type yeah. again you yeah. don't you don't do that the fulfillment is it you don't revert it's like reversing the fulfillment so yeah. you don't uh, you, you don't do that it would be like you, you know christ uh, uh john 19 says christ is the uh uh the lamb you, you know not a bone of him will be broken so it'd be like going back and sacrificing lambs again which again they think in the temple there'll be sacri sacrifice of animals again and so forth and so on Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I think that this is not recognizing the broad, redemptive fulfillment flow of history. You look at other types, they're not fulfilled. Christ is the bread of life, John 6. We're not going to go back and have manna again. Yeah. And so on and so on. Yeah. John, Christ is the true vine. You know, we're not going to, you know, go back and sit under our vines as, as Israelites in the eschatological period, et cetera. Mm. Mm, yeah, and I think that's, for me, that was just what made this book so powerful, because it it, it was a little bit paradigm, you know, shifting for me. And I really yeah. want to go back and, and, and reread it. But, it was for um, me, too. But it, it's, you know, as I was reading it, it just put so much, like, weight and significance on on what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be an image of God, a, a, a priest, to be a part of the kingdom. Um, Amen. And, and, and just, uh, it, yeah. it was so, just... This idea of reversing history, it's like, you know, I, I remember um, when uh, I was writing my wife, we hadn't been married yet. I was in England. She was in Texas. We were writing, and, and I had a picture of her. And who knows? Maybe I hugged it and kissed it. I had a friend that he was in a similar situation. He did that. 
And so when I would write her, I would look at the picture. When I get a letter from her, I would look at the picture, cherish it. Um, yeah, but now we've been married almost 44 years. And if we're in the evening sitting in our living room and I'm in one chair and she's another and I'm hugging and kissing the picture, I, something's wrong with me. I, I'm, I'm reversing the history of our relationship. Yeah. You don't do that. In fact, yeah. she'd probably call my pastor and say, my husband needs counseling, you yeah. know, and so on. So, uh, the, and that is, Christ has come. Mm. We don't hug the picture and kiss the picture anymore. Yeah. We don't, we don't want to expect a physical t- Christ is here. Mm. <laughs> so it's, you, you said it, it affects Christian life. It also makes the whole thing Christological. Christ is oh, the center. Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. You're right. I mean, it was for me. It just it clicked and it made it so clear. You know, because I think for a lot of people, like you said, when you look, you know, it's just a very popular, common uh, uh, teaching in eschatology that we're looking forward to a future temple. And what you laid out here, um, it just shatters that paradigm in, entirely. The thought of going back to a physical temple is 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 bizarre. Um, yeah, it's just like uh, I, I, I think that's a good way to put it. I do have some good colleagues and friends who believe that, but I, I just disagree. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I um, disagree so, with me. So, what can I say? So I have a question. Um, I think you mentioned this at, at some point, and I've heard this, and this is something that uh, we see in, in I can't remember what which one of the scrolls it's in a Dead Sea scroll that uh, talks about the um, the importance of what was being done in the temple. Um, needed to be done at certain times because it would parallel what was happening in the heavens. Yeah. So my question there, that really got me thinking about time in heaven. Some people take the notion that heaven is timeless. Um, But looking at that paradigm with the temple, it makes me seem like things are running parallel. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't have any specific thoughts, only to say the reason for trying to imitate the heavenly temple is to show that the temple on earth, again, was was its reflection. That, that's, I think, all, I, I think that's what they were trying to emphasize. Yeah, I got you. Um, okay, so my next question, you mentioned in Ezekiel 1, it shows us that there, there's always been a temple in heaven. Yeah. So... Does Christ's work on the cross have an effect in that heavenly temple? Yes, it's uh, it's huge. Um, Romans three twenty five says that Christ was set forth as a hilasterion in His blood, and that word hilasterion is translated propitiation. He set forth mm-hmm. as a propitiation in His blood. Some translations translate it as expiation. Some translate it as a um, uh, uh, a sacrifice for forgiveness and so on. Yeah, you should look at the various translations. They vary. Hmm. The actual word, if you look, it's only used one other time, and that's in the book of Hebrews, but it's used all the time in the Pentateuch. If you look it up in the Greek Old Testament, it means mercy seat. It is the lid of the Ark of the Covenant, hmm. where the blood was sprinkled once a year by the high priest on Yom Kippur. And um, uh, so, and that represented uh, the substitution, that sacrificial animal's blood represented the penal substitution for the people. It was the place where God's wrath was carried out on the animal instead of the people. Now, Christ is the mercy seat. He's set forth as the mercy seat, and you can see why, in his blood. So, uh, he is actually at the cross He was in the Holy of Holies, in the heavenly temple, Mm. the true Holy of Holies, offering this sacrifice. Mm. And the book of Hebrews, if you read carefully chapters 9 and 10, it will elaborate on that. For example, it says that um, yeah, into the second uh, place the high priest enters once a year, that is the Holy of Holies, not taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way now into the holy place has not yet been disclosed 
while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the time then present. And uh, then it talks about Christ. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, Mm. that is to say, not of this creation. It was the one in heaven. Mm. So everything that happened on earth, priest entering into the holy place, that was but a parable, as the text says here. That's yeah. the word for symbol, it's parabole. Uh, that, that, that was really referring ultimately and pointing to Christ, who would enter into the true holy of holies. So Romans 3.25 is a text, you know, most people can't even pronounce propitiation. And I would say, forget all those translations and just go with mercy seat. That's what it means. Mm. And people can understand that. You yeah. Draw the picture of the temple. That's very understandable. Nobody understands propitiation. Yeah. Yeah, but mm, that, that is so powerful. I, I just absolutely love that. Um, it's a, uh, it's it certainly changes the way you think about um, it's, it's, with eschatology. And you know, people try to make it out like if you symbolize Christ ruling now in heaven, that somehow it's it, it's not going to be the, like like it almost like they paint it like that. It, like it, it, it cheapens. Um, his reign, like we're we're waiting for the real reign in a future Honor. temple, yeah. which is, you know, what you've laid out here. Uh, it it, it well, it's very important that. to have a very important to have a physical reign. There's no doubt about that because that's the consummation of yeah. the heavenly reign, and that's yeah. the consummation of the of believers beginning to reign on the earth. It doesn't look like we reign either. Well, it didn't look like yeah. Jesus was reigning when he was on earth either. Sure, but yeah. he was. And then when he rose from the dead and ascended, he really began, that was the consummation of his reign. And then the consummation of our reign will be in the new heavens and earth with him. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that that it doesn't cheapen it. It just shows that's part of the nature of the already and not yet. Once you admit already and not yet, then these Old Testament prophecies, let's say, of the establishment of the temple, for example, it's not going to be a one-time thing or the judgment of the enemies of God's people. It's not a, a, a one-time thing. Um, it is something that begins spiritually in this life mm. and then is consummated. For example, our resurrection that's coming. Yeah. It's a physical resurrection. But John 5, 25 says the time is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Yeah, yeah. John says in First John 2, so, so the... The resurrection there, John 5, has begun spiritually, and it will physically occur in the future. In fact, the text goes on to say, it quotes Daniel 12, too, it says, and a time will come when all who are in the tombs, both believing and unbelieving, will come forth. So there you got John 5, perfect, John 5, uh, 25 to 29, already and not yet, right in a nice package tied in, in a perfect bow for you. And then um, 1 John 2, 18, my little children, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. I tell you, many Antichrists have already come for this. We know it's the last hour. Well, whoa, it was the last hour then. And the reason was that uh, the precursors, the spirit of Antichrist was actually there. 1 John 4, 1 and 2 says his spirit was actually there. And all these Antichrists that he was inspiring, they point to the final consummation of him coming. So you've got an already and not yet antichrist yeah. in First John uh, 2. In fact, if you read on following verses, the phrase the antichrist is used of the group of false teachers. They actually are the antichrist because mm. the spirit mm. of antichrist is uh, inspiring. So there's a good example of uh, already and not yet antichrist. Yeah. It's spiritual. He's not yet there incarnately. Yeah. So this next question is another sidebar. Uh, you got me thinking, speaking about um, Christ and the mercy seat, and this is about the intermediate state. Um, for those, you know, we, we know the thief on the cross was going to be with Christ. Um, he said, you know, this very day in paradise. Um, so my question is, is there a difference in the intermediate state prior to Christ's um, crucifixion and resurrection? I think there is for believers, uh, but not for unbelievers. 
Right. Um, and that's a very good question. Uh, for believers, now, when a believer dies, um, they come into the presence of Jesus Christ. That didn't uh, happen redemptive historically in the Old Testament. Of course, they came into the presence of, of you know, the pre-incarnate Son of God. But now they're coming into the presence of the one who has actually accomplished death and resurrection and penal substitution uh, for them. So that when they actually come into the presence of Christ in that invisible dimension, it is actually an escalation of their kingdom reign that began on earth. And, that, and that's what I believe Re Revelation 24 to 6 is talking about, that when saints die, they reign for a period of time in heaven. I think it's a heavenly reign, not an earthly reign it's talking about there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think John's talking about that nobody can ultimately defeat the saints. When you defeat them, they just bounce right back up, first in spiritual resurrection, Revelation 20, then physical resurrection in Revelation uh, 21 and 22, so that they're actually experiencing their further resurrection, but it is still an incomplete condition in heaven. That sounds interesting because it's, it's not a perfect redemptive historical condition in heaven when they rise spiritually. Why? Because they don't have their bodies. They've got to have their bodies. Then it'll be perfect redemptive historically, but they will be ethically cleansed at that point. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Well, so, I mean, that's, those are just some reflections on, on, on your question. Um, if you were interested, um, I have a chapter at the end of my New Testament biblical theology. And in that chapter, I talk about the major realities that Christ has brought about in the New Testament and how those correspond with Old Testament, the similar Old Testament realities, hmm. like justification by faith or reigning in a kingdom or being sanctified and so on. So wow. there's a difference in all of those. Hmm, and yeah. uh, in fact, I see three stages. There's the Old Testament stage for those realities, the inaugurated Christian stage, and then the consummated stage. Hmm. No, and they're all a little different, but, but they're organically related. Hmm. Yeah, no, that sounds very, very interesting. Um, so I'll, I'm going to ask you again at the end of the program to, to tell me where to find that. But, um, but yeah, that kind of go, kind of goes back to time you know i asked that because we court you know we, we see that's that was my understanding that we would see a difference um you know pre and post uh resurrection um and i always you know i i hear this idea of timelessness but then you see in revelation there's the 30 minutes of silence you have the martyrs saying how how, how long so it does seem that there's um you know this concept of this timelessness doesn't really seem to, to fit or match um what we see in a few places in scripture. So, um, yeah, it's interesting to you say Yeah, that. you do have this statement uh, in Revelation 10, 6, where um, this angel swears to the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there shall be delay no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh trump of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. So what is the mystery of God there? Some think, well, that's redemptive history. Certainly, yeah, redemptive history stops, and then you get new heavens and earth and eternity, and, uh, you know, it's not going to be the same kind of time as you had in redemptive history, chronological uh, um, horizontal time. That's all I can say. I don't know. There's not enough biblical data yeah. to say more. Yeah. So will you call it timelessness? I don't know. <laughs> I call yeah. it, I, I'll stick with the Bible. It's eternity. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But that's still yet to come. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But you do have to realize though, when Jesus says that he who believes in me in the gospel of John has eternal life. And that phrase is used elsewhere in the, New Testament, hmm. um, that begins. That's part of the inauguration. Yeah. So it does begin, the eternal life ironically begins in space-time history. 
Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. In fact, that phrase eternal life comes from Daniel 12 too, which says the saints will rise up. Some will rise to judgment. Others will rise up for blessing and they'll have eternal life. And and that's resurrection life. So when we come to trust in Christ, we are regenerated. What does that mean? Our heart is brought to life. We're raised from the dead spiritually. And that's the beginning of eternal life. Wow. That's incredible. All right. I love that. Um, Yeah, we better. uh, uh, I don't know if the listeners can bear anymore. (laughs) Um, Well, I hope you have time because I've got a few more questions. Um, Do you have have time or? I got a, a, a little. (laughs) <laughs> oh, okay, um, let me let me pick uh, what I want to ask then. Um, We've been before, going an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know. I know. We've been I, going I, an hour and ten minutes. Oh I, my gosh! <laughs> I, I, I had a ton of questions. Um, let me ask about this. Um, so this is, uh, I believe, in, in Zechariah, what we hear about um, the the temple and its its glory. Uh, being greater than the the former temple, referring to Solomon's temple. Um, Talking about um, the Haggai or Zechariah? I think I think, I think Zechariah. Um, no, no, I'm what, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Haggai. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Haggai. Okay. It, it, it is Haggai. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's all right. Yeah. Um, Haggai. Yeah. So, are, you know, what temple uh, is that prophecy referring to? Um, that prophecy is referring to the uh, temple, I believe, the temple of the latter days, number one. And number two, when did the latter days begin? In the New Testament, if you look at that phrase, latter days, 90% of the time, it's already and not yet. So it's about the temple that would be established in the latter days by the Messiah. Now, Zechariah 6 does say that uh, the Messiah would be a king and a priest and establish the temple. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. At least it, at least, what's talked about there is typological of Christ, if not a direct prophecy, at least a typological. Yeah. And so what he would do is bring, see, once Adam falls, priesthood and kingship, uh, the office of king divides, but once the last Adam comes, they come together again at the temple, as it was in in the Eden temple, and uh, and and so I think it's talking about the uh, how that was inaugurated, and uh, and then consummated. So you don't get that. You you know in the Old Testament prophecies, you you just get a prophecy. Oh, the temple. You know what does the text say? He says, um, um, "I'll shake all the nations." They will come with the wealth of all nations. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. Mm-hmm. And in this place, I shall give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So I, th- I think that that's uh, talking about this end time temple. Yeah. And yeah, when you get to the end times, you see that this is part of the mystery. When you get to the end times, you see that these things are not happening with one stroke. There's not one establishment of the temple immediately. There's not one judgment of the nations immediately. There's not, for example, at the end judgment, the righteous was to be were to be separated from the unrighteous. Well, that doesn't happen at the beginning of the kingdom, and um, the kingdom is invisible, whereas it was supposed to be visible. Jesus says, "No, it grows like leaven," hmm. and uh, it was supposed to be huge. Jesus says, "No, it's like a mustard seed." So. You know, the, 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 these Old Testament prophecies begin in an unexpected way. Hmm. And then they're consummated in the way the Old Testament prophets saw it, that would be. Sure. Yeah, sure. So, um, in fact, the introduction to those parables that I was just talking about in Matthew 13, Jesus says, to, to you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. And, and mystery has to do if you look at it in the New Testament with an unexpected fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, it, it actually comes out of Daniel 2, where the king has a vision of this big statue and it's smashed by a rock. He didn't know what it means. Daniel says, here's what it means. Uh, the four sections are kingdoms that are all evil. They'll be destroyed at the end time. God will set up his eternal kingdom. Well, that was certainly an unexpected uh, interpretation for Nebuchadnezzar because he was the head of gold. 
He was the, <laughs> the first section of that statue. So it's about an unexpected eschatological um, thing. In fact, I've written a whole book on it called, yeah. Yeah, um, it. what is it? Um, Mystery Revealed. Hidden, hidden, but but now revealed. Hidden, hidden, hidden but now revealed. Biblical yeah. theology and mystery. Yeah. So um, anyway, that that's what you have, and 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 and, and Haggai two is a good example of that. It looks like God's going to make the latter glory of the temple uh, of the uh, of the latter day temple greater than the present temple, and um, uh, it looks like it's just going to be you know one act, but no, it's a it's it's an already and not yet thing, and the already extends for a period of time. Yeah. Hmm. So I do have a question. About that's, the why, that's why you have to read those Old Testament prophecies. Now, there is a hint about already and not yet in the Old Testament, but uh, there's not much hint of it. But, for example, in, in Psalm 110, uh, uh, God says to the Messiah prophetically, rule in the midst. <clears throat> rule in the midst of your enemies. Well, that shows there's going to be this, this extended battle. Uh, <clears throat> so he says, sit at my right hand mm. until I make your enemies a footstool for my your feet. Mm. Uh, rule in the midst of your enemies. So there you get this uh, at least an extended period of time. We don't know how long from the yeah. uh, psalmist perspective, but and you do get a hint of it occasionally, but not, not very much. Hmm. So let me ask about Zechariah, because this is one that um, I think you touched on in the book, and I have so many. Well, this is just a burning question I have. The the picture of Israel at peace with no walls. Um, yeah. Where do you place that? Well, that's part of this this process of god breaking out of the holy of holies his his special revelatory glorious presence then as it breaks out from the holy of holies it covers the city covers the holy land and then the whole earth um in terms of how you where you place that specifically in redemptive history um i think you have to see all of it, both the breaking out of the temple, covering the holy, of, uh, covering the city, covering the um, the um, promised land, and then the whole earth. I think you have to see that as inaugurated. So even going to the Gentiles shows, hey, we're now beginning to cover the world with the temple. Okay. Not consummated, but yeah. we're, it's beginning. All of that, he breaks it. He begins to break out of the temple. He begins to um, create a new city, okay, and and a new people to dwell in a promised land, so that the new city, Paul Paul says, Jerusalem above is our mother. Wow, okay, so yeah. we're part of the Jerusalem above, not down here, hmm. and then uh, we're we're not Israel dwelling in the promised land. Uh, we're true Israel. Dwelling in Christ, who is true Israel, hmm. and then and then we're going to the nations. We're beginning to cover the earth. So all of that is inaugurated in that in that broad way. I think that's about as specific as I can be. Yeah, that's a very good question. Hmm. Yeah. So maybe you have one more. No, question. there are no there are no walls anymore because um, we're not talking about physical structures. This yeah. is with the temple. Oh yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm, I'm tracking with you. Um, but you have to remember, just as some are expecting a physical temple, some are expecting a physical new Jerusalem in the millennium. You gotta, so you got to remember that, too. Hmm. Yeah, I didn't think about that. Which I would disagree with. Yeah, no, yeah, for sure. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Antichrist defiling the, the temple and people are looking forward to a future physical temple and some sort of a you know, something he's doing in the Holy of Holies. Now, looking at this from, from this point of view, um, defiling the church, uh, leading them into apostasy, do you see that apostasy happening gradually, or is that something that's um, going to, or is that something immediate, or 
could it be could it be both i guess something that's inaugurated now and then you know i'm going to try to answer your question briefly which is very hard to do but i will refer you and readers to my commentary on first and second thessalonians hmm. where uh, i discuss the antichrist in the temple in second thessalonians 2 if you remember it says verse 3 let no one in any way deceive you for it the day of the lord will not come until the apostasy the Falling away comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship. So he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So there's some who understandably take that, hey, that there's got to be a temple for the Antichrist to enter into and to sit on a seat. And... Uh, so I, it does say apostasy, whether it comes first and then the man of lawlessness, where they come together, that's hard to know. Um, but probably, since it says it comes first, then the man of lawlessness is mentioned, probably he comes right on the heels of this apostasy. And so I, I do um, take this as a future falling away not, I don't think it refers to hardened Jews, the majority of the nation who's unbelieving. I don't think it's referring to that. I don't think it's referring generally to the unbelieving world. How can they fall away? They're already fallen. They're already apart from God. Mm-hmm. I think this is referring to a time in the future where the worldwide church in general across all denominations will fall away. And there'll only be a very small remnant and that the Antichrist will enter into the church. Hmm. He will become powerfully influential in the whole church, hmm. and that's the temple. If you right. study it, it says he comes into the temple of God. If you study that phrase, naos tutheu, temple of God, you study that in the New Testament, especially in Paul, always refers to the church. Yeah. Except in the Gospels where you have that statement, destroy this temple in three days I'll raise it up, and it's, it's the temple of God is used there. But that's the historical transition. Yeah, sure. It's Christ is talking about the physical temple that will be destroyed in 70 AD, but he's talking about himself, too. It's a double yeah, entendre, exactly. which occurs yeah. often in John. And and then he'll raise it up in three days. That's obviously his resurrection body that is the temple. So there, that's a redemptive historical transition. Everywhere else, uh, uh, temple of God refers to uh, the church. And especially in Paul, it's where it occurs most uh, in Revelation. Uh, that's what it refers to. And the temple in Revelation uh, refers to the temple in heaven. And so, uh, really, this this would almost this would be virtually the only place where you get uh, temple of God referring to a physical temple. Now, some would argue that in Revelation 11, where it talks about the temple of God to measure it, et cetera, and leave out yeah. the court. I'm not going to get into that tonight, but you can go to my commentary, see how I understand it. I don't think that's referring to the physical temple. I think it's referring to the church. So I think here, the Antichrist in the future, it's true, this is future. He's going to come into the church, and uh, he is going to influence it terribly. So, um, and in and, and the church will only, so so here, the uh, uh, the temple of God is the covenant community. And the majority of that covenant community will have fallen away, but there's a remnant in it. Yeah. Yeah. But then the text goes on in verse 7 and says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So this coming of Antichrist, yes, it's future, but he's already begun to come through the false teachers. And as a group corporately, they can be called the Antichrist. So... Yeah, that's, that's in my mind where I was thinking that there's, it's already begun. It, it in that sense, it's consummated or it's uh, it's inaugurated. Um, but I do see. I, I would agree with you. This does seem like this is a uh, a future fall, falling away for yeah. You know, a, a large portion uh, of the believing church. Well, these have been uh, amazingly hard questions. Boy, you're not letting me off the hook, are you? Well, like I said, I just um. I cannot, not, 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 not recommend this book more. 
Um, seriously, if you are listening to this and you have not paused this, if you've not gotten the book, you've not read it, you just absolutely have to. Um, like I said, I'll probably go back and read it again after after this. Um, it's just uh, it is just so good. One, one major thing I, I got from this book, as you just mentioned, referring to this temple here, which is I, I've almost I've always heard this as some sort of a physical temple. And you what you've done is you've taken this seriously when Paul is talking about temple. Um, as the church being the temple, and 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 let's just take that f- for, for what it is, and 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 let's take it seriously, and it it just once we can really realize that and take ownership of that, and it's it just it's it's so so empowering and, and powerful, um, and, and humbling. Honestly, uh, it, it's it's very weighty to think about that, um, about us as Christians being living stones, being the dwelling place, uh, dwelling yeah. place, uh, yeah. for God, it's, it's, uh, it's unreal. So, um, so anyway, uh, I'll say it again. I love the book. Um, and then yeah. I'd like to end the interview on, um, I mean, the, the book is called the temple and the church's mission. And at the end of the book, you answered the question, what the church's mission is. And I think you used a, a shark analogy. Do you mind yeah. ending on that note, sharing that? Um, yeah, I think if the I think it's a might have been a fish analogy that if if you keep it may have been a shark I can't remember now but if you apparently if you let's say it was a shark if you keep a shark in a small uh, area of water uh, very small it will not grow to its full size but you got it's got to, you got to let it out and so it's the same with the church the church has to expand or it'll It'll, it'll, it'll remain um, uh, ingrown. Hmm. I think that's the idea. If I'm remembering the illustration, right? Yeah, no, that, that sounds about right. And uh, Sometimes I need to go back and remind myself of the details. <laughs> no, but I, I like was, that picture. It was 2004, and I, I haven't reviewed that particular illustration since then. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, I just, I, I love that picture, and I, lo- I love the book, and I love this perspective um, of the temple and, and how it applies to eschatology, and um, it's really, uh, it, it's, um, it's something that just helps for me all of Scripture fit in the beginning of the interview you talked about. Yeah. You know, you, you just tied the very end to the very beginning, and yeah. it, it, this is one cohesive story we see. Um, yeah. You it's exciting. We are. Very exciting. It's extremely it exciting. Well, um, Mr. Delgado, thank you so much for this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, thank tell you me, for your tell, time. Tell me when we're off the camera now. Um, we'll, we'll go and wrap. Um, I guess if there's any, you know, thing you want to say, tell people where you can get the book and you can close this out in prayer. We'll end like that. Okay. You, so you want me to close out in prayer? Uh, yeah, sure. If you're ready. Okay. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for dis- the, the time and the, the opportunity and the privilege of discussing your word. And we pray that we would all uh, be shaped by it, increasingly shaped and renewed according to your image, that we would reflect your glory in what we say and think and do. In Christ's name, amen. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to share this with somebody you know. Like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. If you're listening on your favorite podcasting app, leave us a rating and review. You can email me at theweirdchristianpodcast at gmail.com. And with that being said, we'll catch you on the next one.